So one thing that I think we really need to emphasize is that old Donnie doesn't like his supporters. In fact, he rather hates them and is revolted by them. But he needs them for their votes and for their donations and for their attention, so he begrudgingly pretends to like them. But while Trump thinks he has absolutely nothing in common with his working and middle class voters that support him, fundamentally they do share something, which is that the entire world is mocking and insulting and humiliating them right now, and deservedly so. So with that in mind, I have a couple clips to play for you. One really emphasizes how Trump and his movement continue, rightfully, to be the laughing stock of anybody in this planet with a quarter of a brain or more, and fundamentally how Trump is being mocked by other Republicans, while on the surface, he seems to be winning at a fancy dinner party where only Republican elites were there and Trump wasn't. They ripped and tore him to shreds, laughing at him like the buffoon he is. Um, they're speaking to the same crowds that are filling them with fear, victimization, and this idea that liberty is being taken from you. And that's sort of a deadly cocktail which allows all these folks to be afraid. And at the end of that, they sell them guns. And as you just noted, I mean, you've traveled around the country asking Trump supporters and members of the GOP about their beliefs. I mean, these, these are amazing if people haven't seen them. What, what is the one thing people who despise Trump, of which there are many in the country, what should they understand about the people who still support him? Because you've talked to a lot of these people at these rallies. You know, something... I think where things become difficult, people often ask me, can people change, uh, can Trump supporters change their mind? Can you ever win an argument with a Trump supporter? Yeah. And I think you can, you can convince somebody uh, to change ideas. You can have discussions over what people want. You can't have discussions over who people are. And what Trump has done is he's made the MAGA hat a symbol of who he is and who they are. And so you put that thing on, you don't believe in those ideas, you believe this represents you. And I was talking with a, a gun rights advocate, Ryan Bussey, recently, and he equated the MAGA hat with the AR-15. And so we look at this, mm. this gun culture we're a part of, and you have discussions of how do we lower these casualties, and you bring up something like assault weapons, and what they've trickily done is they've made the AR-15 15 a new MAGA hat. So you can't debate whether or not that is something a child should have, because now that's become a point of pride and a point of identity. And that, that to me, is something that is really hard to change. Yeah. Let's take a look at some of your interviews from the day former President Trump was arraigned uh, in New York City, and we'll talk about it on the other side. I don't believe we're, yeah, what, no, we're, right. what you're seeing is justice. You don't believe in the grand jury process? I don't believe if, if, if this was a, a civilian, it would. I mean, he is a civilian. He's a person, but New York address. So he shouldn't go through the grand jury process. I believe it should be uh, dismissed. Because? Because um, I, uh, I'm i going by a general gut feeling. The way I see it is... Uh... You know, the, the government is uh, stepping over their bounds and doing what they're doing here, uh, indicting Donald Trump. Uh, this stuff happens all the time. What and, stuff? Uh, paying off a board star and then uh, fudging business records? I mean, come on, it's his own money for one thing. And out of all the cases up against Donald Trump, this is probably the weakest one. It's probably the weakest one. Yeah. 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 So when I watch that and I hear jaw dropping comments like that, which by the way, you've done many, many videos that are similar. You seem to think very quickly on your feet, but how do you prepare to kind of dive into those Trump rallies or, or events where there's going to be a lot of Trump supporters? <laughs> well, there's a Zen I have to get into first and <laughs> foremost to be prepared to, to get all sorts of new creative ideas. Medication helps. <laughs> uh, intoxication also doesn't hurt. Uh, we but often do you talk anticipate about where you're uh, treating them? this. Yeah, we, we, we almost call it debate prep. I, I go out there with certain yeah. assumptions. Um, I, I, I read the news sources. A lot of the folks at these rallies are ingesting. I check out Newsmax, OAN. I go on the Reddit boards. You understand these arguments. We debate prep it. We talk about these arguments. We talk about follow-up questions we have. We look at lo mm -hmm. for logical fallacies, and then we go into the world and engage. And more often than not, the people that you talk to haven't had to go beyond that first gut reaction to follow up with that second question. And that's where we find the humor and or the anthropological uh, interest. Turns out the follow-ups may be what get people sometimes. Uh, you've also done a lot of work diving into some of the wildest MAGA conspiracy theories, of which there are many. What has been the wildest thing you've uncovered or something that's really stuck out to you? 
<laughs> well, I, I'm shocked at how often JFK Jr. is invoked as not only somebody who is still alive, but who is now a Republican <laughs> and potentially mm -hmm. in the Oval Office. Um, I think a thing that really scares me, though, is how so many folks in the MAGA movement are unable to let go of the idea that Donald Trump isn't still in power. And not that he won the election. That seems to be commonplace right now. You believe that he won the election. It's more so the number of people who truly believe that he still has power. He's still making decisions. And I think that that goes to how much we want to believe these conspiracies are true to the point that we can't even relinquish uh, the idea that Donald Trump doesn't pull the strings anymore. And that's just sort of that, that's that's the magic trick he's pulled. It's somebody who's so afraid of of loss and admitting any kind of defeat that even his supporters can't uh, admit that he doesn't have that power currently. John, you know, more than one pundit has proclaimed that the NRA's influence uh, in the GOP is waning. I mean, that's been a storyline for a few years now. But how can that be the case if all of these presidential hopefuls are flocking to be part of this convention? It's not the case when it comes to their influence over the base. It is the case that the NRA is a severely weakened and diminished organization because of the scandals, um, financial and otherwise, uh, that have, have, have emerged in recent years and weakened the organization, the leadership of Wayne LaPierre, and caused a lot of defections from their board. But you still see these presidential candidates go to kiss the ring because at this stage, it's very much about appealing uh, to the base. And, and particularly, you know, when it comes to Second Amendment voters, the NRA is still the most powerful lobby that there there is. And Margaret, I mean, th there were some very uh, various different reactions, we'll just put it that way, uh, for the uh, speakers. Uh, let's start with what happened when former Vice President Mike Pence uh, greeted the crowd. Let's listen to that. I love you too. I hope you gave Pence a good uh, warm approval. Because, no, because he is, a, he is a nice man, if you want to really know the truth. He is. He's a good man. Uh, and I heard it was very rough. Margaret, what is your sense of that? I mean, my, how is Mike Pence going to win the Republican nomination when he's getting booed at an NRA convention like that? I mean, what you see is that the NRA convention, like John referenced, you know, it, it is a vestige, it is part of the base of the Republican Party. Uh, it's a specific, you know, faction of the base of the Republican Party, which is a Trump base. There is, you know, Mike Pence's team would argue, uh, a deeply evangelical, uh, observant Christian base of the party that is more likely to be sympathetic to Mike Pence as a candidate. That's at least what they're planning on. But the NRA... <laughs> even though it, it is waning. I mean, most NRA members, as we know, are even for reasonable restrictions yeah. uh, in, in gun control and gun reforms, right? They're for background checks. They're for um, safety checks. There, you know, there are moderate Republicans and NRA members who are absolutely for moving this debate forward, but it has become a special interest of the Republican Party that is beholden to the base. And so it no longer functions as an issue advocacy organization as much as a arm of the Republican Party. Yeah. And if I could just add, though, there's a particular irony for a group that says it's all about defending the Constitution, attack booing a vice president who did more than any other individual on January 6th to defend the Constitution. Let's not forget yeah. that. And I, but I guess, I, you know, I can hear there are folks that I have to imagine there are folks at home who are frustrated about all of this, given what took place in Nashville, given what took place in Louisville that we just can't get to a place where any kind of, you know, real meaningful uh, gun control legislation can get passed in this country. And it, it does seem as though when you have major presidential candidates at the NRA, that 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 is that is the main stumbling block. Can I just say, Jim, I mean, that's absolutely true when it comes to gun reform. It's absolutely true when it comes to reasonable restrictions around abortion. It's absolutely true when it comes to questions of climate control. So if you are an issue, climate change, if you are an issue advocacy voter, if there's an issue that is important to you, maybe what you ought to look at is the kind of election reforms that are going to depolarize the country and start representing what the majority said. of Americans and not a narrow faction of a base of one political party. Yeah.
Amen. And John, and John, this afternoon, Georgia's Governor uh, Brian Kemp is urging fellow Republicans to move on from election fraud claims. CNN obtained a copy of remarks uh, Kemp prepared for a private RNC donor retreat. Uh, he doesn't really name Trump, uh, but Kemp says uh, 2020 is ancient history. Not a single swing voter in a single swing state will vote for our nominee if they choose to talk about the 2020 election being stolen. So you can see that first clip really emphasizes, and it's not all jokes, that's you know, one of the Daily Show correspondents, and what he does is very seriously point out the danger of Trump and his movement and of their misinformation ideology, but doing so in a way that does mock and, and bring a little bit of humor. And I think you need that. We, we live in such a dark, cynical world and such a concerning time that you, know, you don't want to make light of the danger of Trump and Trumpism, of the MAGA world and other dangerous elements within the Republican Party, uh, and what they pose uh, in the short, medium, and long term, danger from everything from human rights to the environment and everything in between. But you have to laugh at these SOBs sometimes, and you have to point out the absurdity of it all, because I think it's important to understand how crazy it all is, because I think sometimes we get desensitized. And so whether it's Trump himself or the rank and file flyover country supporters that he that he um, that he pretends to like, they are all worthy of mocking. They really are not necessarily any random person that maybe voted for Trump once in 2016, but people that are still going to MAGA rallies in 2023 are openly supporting a fascist and should be mocked as such. And in that second one, it notes there that while, yes, Trump still has a lot of influence, as you could see, we covered this, Pence got booed at the NRA thing and Trump got cheered. You see one of the most influential rising star Republicans, and that quote was him, I think, at like a gala, like a fancy dinner gala or whatever. He was criticizing Trump. He didn't have to say his name, but he basically said, if we're stuck in the past in 2020, we're going to get walloped in 2024. And he's 100% right. So bear this in mind. Donald Trump wants nothing to do with the regular people that support him. He thinks he's fundamentally better and different than them. But at the end of the day, they're just two groups of idiots stuck in the past, destroying any chance they have of relevancy ever again.